Sorry, Jim. Good evening, everyone. I'm Chris Stover, the Executive Director of the Canadian Center for Ethics in Public Affairs. It's co founded by the Atlantic School of Theology at St. Mary's University and has a mandate to provide an arena for critical thinking, public discussion, and research into current ethical challenges in society. We acknowledge our presence today in the traditional lands of the Mi'kmaq the ancestral lands of the Mi'kmaq Nation. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship with Mi'kmaq and Maliseet peoples, which was first signed by the British Crown in 1725. The treaties did not deal with surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq and Maliseet title and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. I'd also like to welcome our live stream audience this evening and I hope you'll join in in the Q&A which you can do through the chat feature on the SESEPA YouTube channel. SESEPA's relationship with the Marshall Lecture in Public Philosophy dates back to 2009 when we first collaborated on a lecture entitled Morality and Starvation. And since that time, we've covered an awful lot of ground together with talks about robots, climate change, the dilemmas of protecting religious freedoms, sex differences in the human genome, public morality and virtue ethics, evil and inexcusable wrongs. So SEP is very grateful for this ongoing partnership with Roland Marshall and the philosophy department at St. Mary's. It's quite a valued opportunity to showcase the philosophical perspective on so many areas of shared concern. And tonight, we'll turn our head to relationship ethics. But before I hand off to Dr. Mark Mercer, who is the chair of the philosophy department here at St. Mary's, I just want to call your attention to the table at the back. There's some interesting information about SUSEPA back there. There's some DVDs you're welcome to take home that have programs of relative interest. And I'd also like to let you know that there's an evaluation on the table in front of you. Your feedback is really important, helps us do even better programs next time. So now we'll have a few words from Mark. Well, welcome to the Roland Marshall Lecture this year. I want to thank the Office of the Vice President of Academic and Research here at St. Mary's for generous support of the uh, Roland Marshall Lecture. I'd also like to thank SESEPA and the Roland Marshall Fund. It's always a delight, the Roland Marshall Lecture in Public Philosophy, and I want to tell you just a little bit about the lecture series. Roland Marshall is here, just sitting there. Uh, what, one, two, three, four um, rows, uh, rows here. Um, it was about 15 years ago, Roland Marshall thought that philosophers were saying a lot of very interesting and very important things about matters that are of significance to all of us, about race, about nationalism, about art, about science, about religion. But Roland thought that the philosophers were talking to themselves, that they were writing in journals and writing in technical language, and he thought that it was important that philosophers uh, speak to the public in uh, ways, in venues that the public can, uh, can attend and in ways that the public can understand. And that was the impetus for creating the Roland Marshall uh, Lecture in Public Philosophy. And we've had uh, terrific um, sessions uh, since then, and I think that uh, uh, Roland's ideal of um, informed and rigorous discussion about important matters um, uh, has, uh, has, has paid off, and uh, we, we've, uh, we're, we're very pleased that uh, Roland has uh, created uh, this series. Um, I want now to introduce Scott Edgar. Scott Edgar is going to introduce our, uh, ma our main speaker tonight, Adrian. Uh, Scott's a member of the philosophy department here at St. Mary's. He's been here, oh, only four years, five, three years. He's been here <laughs> three years. Uh, and Scott knows um, Adrian from his days at the University of uh, Pittsburgh, All right? Uh, Pennsylvania. Ah, got that wrong too. Uh, anyway, uh, Scott Edgar will introduce Adrian Martin. Um, 
It is a pleasure for me to introduce Adrian Martin. Uh, Professor Martin is the Akshata Murthy 2002 and Rishi Sunak Associate Professor of Philosophy, Politics, and Economics, uh, as well as the George R. Roberts Fellow at Claremont McKenna College, which is in Claremont, California. Uh, before going to Claremont McKenna, Professor Martin was a fellow in bioethics at the United States Institutes for Health and an assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Professor Martin writes about moral theory. She writes about general moral theory, moral psychology, and applied ethics. And she has written about some of the standard topics in philosophical ethics, including central questions in Kantian moral theory and questions about the nature of practical reason. Uh, however, most of Professor Martin's work is anything but standard. Uh, if you look at the papers that she's published in journals like Philosophy and Phenomenological Research, the American Journal of Bioethics, and the Journal of Philosophy, to name just a few, you'll find that her work is mostly about uh, moral phenomena that standard philosophical ethics ignores. Uh, she asks questions about aspects of our moral experience that very few philosophers ever think to ask questions about. So for example, uh, she's written about apology. She's written about what it is for one person to apologize to another person. Uh, and she also has a theory of what love is. She's also, in her 2014 book, How We Hope, A Moral Psychology, which was published by Princeton University Press, given a theory of what it is to hope against hope, that is, what it is to hang on to your hope, uh, even in circumstances when what you hope for uh, is something that you have no reasonable reason to expect it, it could actually happen. A lot of people think that in those kinds of circumstances, there is no hope. Uh, you have no hope of what you hope for. But Martin argues that hope gives a person reasons uh, to act in some ways that can, among other things, sustain that person through the ordeal that she's experiencing. Uh, Professor Martin's work is typically full of insight, full of imagination, and often very surprising. So. Uh, I was extremely fortunate as a grad student. I got to see Professor Martin give uh, what I still think of as one of the best philosophy talks I've ever seen in my life. Uh, it was a talk where at the top of the hour, she told the room that she was going to defend a theory of what hope is that none of us believed. Uh, and at least by the end of the hour, she had convinced those of us who were graduate students. Uh, so I think we're in for a real treat tonight. Uh, Professor Martin's talk tonight is called How to Betray Your Android, Relationship Ethics, and Personal Investments. Uh, please join me in welcoming her to St. Mary's. Thank uh, everyone at the Canadian Center for Ethics and Public Affairs, as well as St. Mary's, for their work putting together this event. Um, it's an honor to be here. Um, okay, so this needs to go here. Yes. Okay, so yes, that is the title of my talk. Um, How to Betray Your Android, Relationship Ethics and Interpersonal Investment. Um, okay, so here we go. Uh, the first section of the talk is titled, Human AI Relationships. So this is Mia, a so-called synth from the British-American co-production Humans. Mia is part of a human and synth family where the synths have advanced programming that makes them sentient. The family spends the first season trying to find a safe place to live in a society conflicted over the status of synths and the nature of synth-human relationships. I have a lot of echo up here. Is it echoey out there? Is it just me? You guys, it's good for you? Okay, I'll look at it then. Okay, this is Ethan, um, a humanic from the American show Extant. Um, Ethan is the prototype of a new approach to AI, being raised as a human child by the man who created him and that man's wife, who happens to be Halle Berry, an astronaut impregnated by an alien. Ethan and Mia, and many other AI characters from science fiction, present us with an anxiety that is increasingly pressing. The anxiety that we won't know for certain when we owe AIs the same respect, concern, and consideration that we owe each other. We make robots and computers better and better at simulating human interactions. 
Yet plenty feel there is room to doubt whether an AI, even one that perfectly mimics human behavior, is a moral subject on the par of humans. Mia and Ethan appear to enter into fully human relationships of care, concern, um, and altruistic sacrifice. Moreover, many of these relationships are mutual on the side of the humans. Some humans enter into what we may as well call human relationships with the AIs. Some do so only reluctantly and confusedly. Others perceive AI humanity or personhood naturally and unquestioningly. Um, all, once they have embraced the relationship, believe they owe a good deal to these AIs, the reciprocals of the care, concern, and sacrifice that the AIs show them. Now, most public and academic discourse about the ethical status of AIs focuses on whether they should be afforded rights. Ultimately, I want to explore the distinct, the related question of what it looks like when human AI relationships become relationships of mutual investment and trust. And for full disclosure, this talk isn't really about androids or artificial intelligence. The subject of my talk today is human relationships in general, not only human AI relationships. So I aim to persuade you that what I call interpersonal investment is the source of claims and debts that are analogous to, though distinct from, rights and duties. So why is this important? When we talk about claims, or as I'll later come to say, calls that people make upon each other in virtue of their moral status and relational ties, when we talk about claims and debts, we're talking about what people owe to each other how we should treat each other, how to respond appropriately to the value that resides in each of us. These matters play out in a variety of arenas. For example, moral and political theory, public policy, and our personal relationships. The significance of my thesis at the top here is that if within each of these arenas we focus exclusively on rights and duties, then we end up with incomplete moral and political theory that doesn't fully address how we should treat each other, inadequate protections and support within our public policy, and impoverished conceptions of our interpersonal relationships. Okay, section one is titled, Affording a Being Rights, Demands and Resentment. Okay, so let me begin with this question of rights for, for AIs. I'm not going to comment on what capacities a being must possess to qualify as a rights holder. I suspect it has something to do with self-awareness and self-direction. But what matters for my purposes is instead how we go about affording a being rights. We could simply grant the, the being certain protections and privileges under the law. However, those who believe we should treat AIs as rights holders intend further that we recognize them as having a certain pre-legal moral status or standing. Imagine, for example, that we decided to afford AIs legal protections for purely pragmatic reasons. We think, perhaps, that to be as useful as possible, AIs need to integrate as seamlessly as humans into our daily lives. And this can happen only if they have roughly the same legal status as humans. Although the AIs would have the same status as humans under the law, the reason that humans have that status is that we believe each human is owed that, that failing to grant them that status wrongs them. This is why when a class of humans is not guaranteed equal protection under the law, they have a basis for protest that their rights are being violated. Each human has, we can say, standing to demand that the law recognize their equal moral status with other members of their society. If we afforded AIs legal rights only instrumentally, we would not yet have acknowledged them as beings capable of being morally wronged with the standing to demand their rightful treatment. And this is what the advocates of rights for AIs really want. Okay, so let me give you a slogan. A being with the standing to demand has a right. This slogan is actually about, is, is about the actions linked to rights. Okay, many rights, of course, are rights to act the right to self-determination or liberty, the right to free speech, the right to dispose of your property as you see fit. The point of the slogan is that the standing or authority to perform a speech act, specifically the act of demand, underpins a claim right. So I'll be talking about speech, speech acts at greater length. So for those unfamiliar with the term, a speech act is basically something you can do with words. Many speech acts can be performed without words, 
But a good indicator of a speech act is that you can do it by saying that you're doing it. So you can say, I hereby demand that you respect my rights. I hereby promise you. I hereby gift you with this. I hereby christen this ship. I hereby pronounce you married. I hereby command you, and so on. So these are all speech acts, commanding, marrying, christening, gifting, and so on. Here's another slogan. A being with the standing to resent has a right. This slogan is about the emotional attitudes linked to rights. At least when we think about humans as rights bearers, we usually see a certain set of attitudes as both natural and appropriate for various parties. We think it is appropriate for someone who has had their rights violated to be angry. We may also realize that it is often unsafe or ineffective for someone who has had their rights violated to express their anger. But this is usually an indictment of their existential conditions and does not undermine the belief that anger is appropriate or even called for. We also think it is appropriate for the wrongdoer to feel guilty. Again, we may also realize that the wrongdoer won't feel guilty for one reason or another, but this does not undermine the belief that guilt is appropriate or even required. And we also think it is appropriate for third parties to be angry on behalf of the wronged party, to be indignant. And yet again, acknowledging that complacency is often the reality does not undermine the belief that anger is appropriate or even acquired. Now, I should be explicit about the direction of inference in these slogans. Okay. We should not preclude that a being that lacks the standing to demand can have rights because we should not preclude that a being without the cognitive capacity for performing speech acts nevertheless has rights. Okay? And we should not preclude that an emotionless being can have rights. So these categories, standing to demand, standing to resent, are not exhaustive of the category of beings that have rights. Okay? The point of the slogans is rather that these are very familiar ways to mark out rights-bearing beings. First, we treat rights-bearing beings as having the authority to issue demands on behalf of their rights. And second, we see certain core forms of moral anger as appropriate responses to failures to uphold their rights. So taking my two slogans together, I'll be treating the standing to demand and the standing to resent as mutually entailing, ultimately as the same thing. But I want to assert this only for beings enough like us with the relevant capacities. I'm not ruling out a different story for different kinds of beings. Okay, so we can see now a natural avenue from interacting with an AI, or any being for that matter, to believing that they should be afforded rights. An AI, like Mia or Ethan, who makes demands on their own behalf, and who gives every appearance of resenting being treated as a lesser class of being, thereby presents us with our most familiar evidence of rights. How can we face down a being's righteous anger or demand for respect and continue to deny them rights? Now, of course, we are, in fact, very good at facing down this kind of evidence, as the human history and contemporary events so sadly show us. But still, it is much harder to resist attributing rights to someone who confronts us in these ways. That is the grip of these evidential marks. Okay. Section two is the reactive attitudes and reciprocity. So I now want to suggest that affording a being rights is just one piece of a much broader stance that one can take towards that being, a broad stance that amounts to relating to that being as a person. In debates about the scope of moral rights, about whether human fetuses have them, or non-human animals, or AIs, the term personhood is often used to indicate a normative status concept. In these contexts, a person just is a rights bearer. But we also use the term person as a broader normative status concept when, for example, we plead that someone see us as a person. When someone asks to be seen as a person, the contrast is with being seen as a thing, as something that can be used or manipulated with impunity. Philosopher Peter Strawson in a, an essay famous in philosophical circles titled Freedom and Resentment. He describes seeing a person as a thing that can be used or manipulated with impunity as taking an objective attitude toward them. He contrasted an objective attitude with the participant or reactive attitudes, which are attitudes that are appropriately directed only at free and accountable beings. The three attitudes I discussed in connection with rights are at the center of Strawson's argument. 
So now let's consider resentment as a reactive attitude. Resentment directed at the weather, your computer, your dog, these are inapt or nonsensical occurrences of the attitude. Unless what you are actually resenting is the incompetent meteorologist or programmer or trainer, the person behind the non-persons that are causing annoyance. Okay. Resentment is, of course, one of the core forms of moral anger that I said marks out a rights-bearing being. What this means is that when we recognize someone as a rights-bearer, by believing that it would be appropriate for them to resent their treatment, or by feeling indignant on their behalf, or by believing their wrongdoer should feel guilty. We are, by Strawson's lights, also marking out their wrongdoer as an accountable being. And that sounds about right. To afford someone rights is in part to hold oneself and others accountable for how they treat that person. Perhaps less obviously, it is also to see the rights bearer as an accountable person because the reactive attitudes have a reciprocating structure. Let me explain what I mean by that. Okay, when empirical moral psychologists study moral emotions, they include in this category attitudes like disgust, contempt, and shame. This is disgust, hopefully you recognize her from inside out, okay. Um, on this view, any emotion that influences moral judgment is a moral emotion. But unlike the reactive attitudes, disgust can take anything as its object, from maggots to Donald Trump. The reason reactive attitudes are limited to accountable people is that they have the important feature of being reciprocal. Okay? They have built into them the expectation that their target respond in a certain way. That's a normative expectation about how they ought to respond rather than a predictive expectation about how they will, in fact, respond. So if I resent someone who wrongs me, here's me being resentful, I at least implicitly think that they ought to feel guilty for what they did. Being disgusted, by contrast, implies no expectations of the object. The neat thing is that if I think this person ought to feel guilt, then I think that they should relate to themselves in exactly the way that I'm relating to them. I think they should hold themselves accountable too. And that implies that they can hold me accountable. It means that they can make claims against me as much as I can against them. If I wrong them, then they have standing to resent me and to expect me to feel guilty, to hold myself accountable. As philosophers like Hegel and Fichte emphasized, the heart of human relations is a kind of mutuality. When I call on you, I make myself available to your call. So when I recognize someone as a rights bearer by believing it would be appropriate for them to resent their treatment, I also believe it would be appropriate for them to believe their wrongdoer should feel guilty, which puts the wronged party into the same reciprocating structure I just described. The wronged party, too, is accountable for their treatment of others. You might think of it this way. There are certain attitudes that have a kind of call and response structure. So when I issue a call, I open myself to the calls of others. And when I say another person can or should issue a call, I say that person, too, can be called upon by others. These are the reactive attitudes. Um, and the resentment, guilt, indignation triad is a prime example of reactive <coughs> attitudes. important point I want to take from Strawson is that there are many, many reactive attitudes. That is, attitudes appropriately directed only at accountable persons with this call and response structure. In addition to the core triad, resentment, indignation, and guilt, he mentions gratitude, forgiveness, love, and hurt feelings. I'm going to read you a long quote from him. Okay. He says, in thinking about the role of such attitudes in our lives, we should think of the many different kinds of relationship which we can have with other people, as sharers of a common interest, as members of the same family, as colleagues, as friends, as lovers, as chance parties to an enormous range of transactions and encounters. Then we should think, in each of these connections in turn, and in others, 
of the kind of importance we attach to the attitudes and intention towards us of those who stand in these relationships to us, and of the kinds of reactive attitudes and feelings to which we ourselves are prone. Now, it can be puzzling what unifies this wide range of attitudes under the heading reactive, other than our intuition that they make sense only in relation to accountable persons. I will suggest that what unifies the reactive attitudes so important to our relating to each other as people is that they are all connected to directive speech acts. These are speech acts that aim to exercise authority over another person's actions. So one directive speech act we've already encountered, demand, and I've connected it with the reactive attitude resentment. So the slogans before about rights become a general heuristic, a paired speech act and a reactive attitude mark out a way of relating to someone as a person, rather than as something that can be manipulated or used with impunity. So now I want to talk about a different reactive attitude, <clears throat> one about which philosophers have generally had little to say. This attitude is disappointment, or the feeling of being let down by someone. And thinking about it will turn our attention away from rights and toward investment. When people live up to it, fail to live up to each other's expectations, a common response is a feeling of disappointment, of being let down. The paradigm case may be parents' disappointment in their children, but the feeling surfaces in many contexts. Children can be disappointed by their parents, and disappointment is a common response to failures within sibling and other familial relationships, too. Friends and colleagues may, be felt, may feel let down by each other's missteps, Teachers may feel disappointed by their students' apathy and students by their teachers. We see this, too, in science fiction explorations of human-AI relationships, AIs appearing to feel not only angry, but hurt and disappointed by the humans who treat them as mere machines. Also, humans feeling disappointed in themselves and each other on behalf of the AIs. Um, so I want to note, although I'm focused today on close personal relationships, it's worth noting that many of the contexts where disappointment occurs are not nearly so personal. Here's a favorite example of mine. It's the recent Save the Drop Drought Awareness Campaign in Los Angeles, which is near where I live. There it is. Okay. An adorable droplet gazes sadly at you from bus stops and billboards. Water isn't angry about your 20-minute shower just disappointed. Politicians and other public figures can also be the targets of disappointment. A citizen may feel let down by a politician's failure to carry through on campaign promises, or a fan can be disappointed in a professional athlete's cheating. In brief, disappointment occurs across a wide spectrum of contexts, ranging from involved and intimate relationships to relationships where the target is unaware that the disappointed person even exists. Okay, so disappointment seems like a reactive attitude, directed appropriately only at accountable persons. The parent disappointed in the child's deception, the faculty member feeling let down by the administrator's ineptitude, the disappointed sports fan, all of these imply that their targets are accountable for their failures, and more specifically, accountable to the people feeling disappointed. Disappointment, though, Related to resentment, oh, sorry, disappointment, though related to resentment and other forms of moral anger, also seems quite distinct from them. It feels different, paradigmatically, to resent someone and to be disappointed in them. So here's a classic angry face that you might associate with resentment. And here's some disappointed faces. Obama is a true master of the disappointed face. <laughs> and Trudeau's not too bad either. So a disappointed expression is definitely closer to basic sadness than basic anger. Metaphorically speaking, resentment is boiling blood and disappointment is sinking gut. So there's a difference between these two reactive attitudes. Um, there's a difference in feeling between them. Uh, it, also feel, it also feels different to be the target of resentment versus of disappointment. It's not as easy to capture this difference in a physical metaphor. Both hot shame and stabbing guilt seem common and appropriate responses to either or both resentment and disappointment. However, 
even if the phenomenological characters of resentment and disappointment aren't saliently different from the perspective of their target, we frequently prefer one to the other. I'm thinking in particular of how it may feel, it may feel easier to be the target of anger than of disappointment. I can handle it if you're angry, just don't feel let down. So talk of being let down also gives us a clue into the difference in content between the two feelings. When I resent the person who fully reclines their airplane seat all the way back for the entire flight, I don't feel they have let me down, but I do feel have they, they have wronged me in a trivial way. So my next aim here is to characterize the difference between disappointments and resentments contents. So before embarking on a positive characterization of this difference, let me say a few words about what the difference is not. First, a tempting account is that resentment is a response to egregious failings and disappointment to lesser. The idea would be that if I attach great importance to, say, the subject of a promise, that sets me up for a family of angry attitudes such as resentment and outrage, while lesser matters leave me poised instead for disappointment. In short, it's tempting to think that the difference between resentment and anger is a matter of degree, tracking the severity of the target's failing. But this is not the right account. If the case of resenting the inconsiderate airplane passenger, a very trivial wrong, doesn't persuade, consider these further points. We often experience simultaneous resentment and disappointment, targeted at the same failing. For example, a friend's or sibling's lie may produce both resentment and disappointment. Since resentment and disappointment are both psychologically and conceptually compatible, they cannot mark a difference in degree of failing. Additionally, um, and as I touched on previously, disappointment can be as or even more awful than resentment. It can be really and truly awful to have someone disappointed in you, so much that you would prefer their anger. Qualitatively, disappointment is not a lesser response for either the person feeling it or for the person targeted. On a related note, it seems plausible that betrayal is a variation or a specification of disappointment, and surely betrayal marks extremely serious failings. All these points cut against the view that disappointment tracks lesser failings than resentment. Another tempting account is that disappointment is eritaic or character-oriented, while resentment is action-oriented. The idea would be that feeling let down by someone marks or implies a negative evaluation of their character, while resentment is reserved for bad actions. So the parent who is let down by the child's deception is actually responding to their inadequate virtue. They are deceptive or weak-willed or frivolous. By contrast, resentment would be a response to the act of deception. But this is also not the right account. A negative evaluation of a person's character is certainly not sufficient for disappointment. It would be downright weird if I were to feel let down by the inconsiderate airplane passenger, even if I look at them and think, what a rude person. Nor is a character assessment necessary for disappointment. We can readily be disappointed in someone for acting uncharacteristically. This is so unlikely, unlike you. How could you do such a thing? So finally, the prevalence of scenarios involving familial relationships might tempt one to think that disappointment is reserved for relationships that are personal, in the sense that the parties know and care about each other. However, disappointment also sensibly occurs in the absence of these factors. So the positive view that I will be developing does say that disappointment presupposes a kind of personal investment. But investment is not reserved for intimate relationships. Rather, the care and entanglement of intimate relationships makes claims of investment come to the fore and claims of right recede to the background. OK, so now we're going to move into the positive characterization uh, in section four, disappointment, investment, and urging. To develop my positive view, I will use my earlier remarks connecting claims of right with the standing to demand respect for one's rights and to resent failures to, re to respect one's rights. An additional way to see this connection is to use what I'll call the who are you to test. So imagine one person making a demand of another or resenting another's behavior. Then imagine the target of the demand or the resentment putting forward a challenge. Who are you to make this demand of me? Who are you to resent me? 
The best answers will establish that the demanding or resentful person has a claim of right that the target person has not met. Now, like resentment, disappointment seems to presuppose a certain standing. We can run the who are you to test to see this. Not just anyone gets to feel disappointed by my failures. Consider the responses that the disappointed person might give if they were challenged in this way. Some potentially satisfactory answers include, I was counting on you. I sacrificed for you. I stuck my neck out for you. I've supported you all these years. That is to say, when we consider the range of cases where, the di where disappointment is an apt response to someone's failing, the common theme is that the disappointed person was invested in the disappointee. The disappointed person might also appeal to a role that is understood to involve investment, such as, I'm your parent or I'm your sister. These observations suggest the disappointment's claim is a claim of investment. Now, for many people, the term claim connotes a right. And since we're not talking about rights here, I'll use the term call instead of claim from here on. Okay. So the invested person can call upon the investee rather than press a claim upon them. So the last piece to fill in is the speech act. How may the investor communicate their call to the investee? Investment also gives a person standing not to demand, but perhaps to urge that their investee live up to the investor's expectations. You can say, come on, do it. You know you should, or even don't let me down. Let me say a bit more about urging. This is an important and frequently used speech act, and not just anyone gets to do it. Imagine someone with no investment in you urging you to do someone. Say a perfect stranger urges you to take more exercise, or practice piano more often, or be more patient with your children. It's important here to distinguish urging from advising. Advising does not presuppose investment, but rather relative expertise. So the perfect stranger can properly, if annoyingly, advise, oh, you simply must visit Machu Picchu. What they cannot do is properly urge, don't let me down by failing to visit Machu Picchu. Huh? Let you down? Let you down? No, to have standing to urge in this way, the person has to be invested in you. Okay, so now let's think about interpersonal investment. There's plenty to be done refining and defending a definition of investment. So today, I limit myself to remarking on five key marks of investment relationships and connecting investment with some basic facts about human vulnerability and dependence. So first, investment includes an enduring and relatively salient motivational commitment to the investee achieving a certain state or status. The state may be internal, as when the investment is in the investee's character, or external, as in when it is in the investee's social status or both. The motivational commitment salience reflects the depth and importance of the investment to the investor, as do the conditions on its endurance. The more important an investment, the more it takes to get the investor to give it up. Second, this commitment entails a willingness to sacrifice for the sake of promoting the achievement. Again, the degree of sacrifice reflects the depth and importance of the investment. If an investment is extremely trivial, then what the investor is willing to put into it may not even feel to them like a sacrifice, but rather something it is easy to give up or away. If, however, a person is willing to put nothing of themselves or their resources into another person, then it's difficult to say there's any sense in which they are invested. Third, whether the investee achieves what the investor hopes they will achieve bears relatively significantly on the investor's well-being. This fact is not necessarily part of the motive for investing, indeed. It's very common for this factor to come into play only because of the investment. For example, a person might invest in someone who has fallen on difficult times without having any prior interest in or concern for that person's condition. It's only after investing emotional or material resources that the person's condition comes to matter to the investor. Fourth, when investment succeeds in giving the investor a genuine call upon the investee, it's typically invited or at least welcome investment. There are cases where even unwelcome investment suffices. 
But I take it these are fringe cases, and that usually when we feel indebted to those who have invested in us, we have welcomed that investment. Okay. Finally, the investor's commitment often involves a willingness to entrust large parts of the achievement-oriented project to the investee. It is possible to invest in someone without being willing to entrust anything to them. So imagine a horrible, controlling stage parent obsessively and destructively invested in their kid's career. This is not typical, however. There is typically this connection between investment and trust, I hypothesize, because interpersonal investment is one of our primary strategies for dealing with the fact that we are vulnerable creatures, insufficient to meeting our own needs without assistance. We invest in others to assist them in their projects, but also as a way of advancing our own projects, and more broadly, building the relationships we need as fundamentally social creatures. More, interpersonal investment and the role we give it in our relationships is a way of valuing our vulnerability and self-insufficiency. Consider, there's arguably a virtue in interpersonal investment. The person who refuses to invest in others or who invests without the willingness to entrust matters of importance to others is overly controlling, unable to accept their vulnerability and lack of self-sufficiency. They want to deny that these features of being human can be the source of good things in our lives. And then there are people who are too quick to invest, or who are poor judges of whom can be trusted with matters of importance. These people, too, don't properly value their vulnerability and lack of self-sufficiency. They treat it cavalierly. People who invest in the right people, in the right way, for the right purposes, and with the right placement of trust, thereby afford their vulnerability and self-insufficiency its proper value. Investing in a person is a kind of compliment. Done with too much restraint, it can be stingy or meager. With not enough restraint or not the right kind of restraint, it can be fawning, unfounded, embarrassing. Done well, it expresses the proper evaluation of the investor's own worth, qua vulnerable and insufficient being, and an accurate assessment of the investee's capacity to value that worth as well. So my hypothesis is that calls of investment and their correlative doubt, debts, the standing to urge, to feel let down, disappointed or even betrayed, all of these reflect the value of our nature as vulnerable and dependent creatures. So now I want to start circling back and bringing together the various ideas and concepts that I've been exploring. So let's start by connecting the idea that interpersonal investment is a way to properly value human insufficiency with the call and response structure of the reactive attitudes. So investing in someone means forming expectations of them, which means being poised to urge them to meet those expectations and to feel disappointed in them should they fail. And disappointment is a reactive attitude which means it calls for its reciprocal in its target. So investing in someone means, uh, also means seeing them as capable of self-disappointment, which means seeing them as capable of disappointment in you and others. You put them into this call and response relationship with you and others by calling on them in the first place. So this is to say that investing in another person is essentially to invite investment in yourself and others. So it's a way of acknowledging, and I would say even valuing, the investees and one's own vulnerability and self-sufficiency, self-insufficiency, rather. In fact, I think it's not a far cry to say that what we really value is not merely our own vulnerability and insufficiency, but rather the possibility of interdependence. Now, another comparison with rights may be illuminating. When we respect each other's rights, are we valuing something in particular about each other? I once again have space only to hypothesize rather than argue, but I suspect that respect for rights is about valuing people as creatures capable of self-direction or self-governance. At a very basic level then, rights are about people giving each other space to be independent, and investments are about pulling people closer into interdependence. Beyond this basic level, though, matters quickly become more complicated. A lot of the time, 
Invite investment is precisely what we need in order to develop our capacities as self-direction or self-governance, or to pursue the projects that we have autonomously adopted. Hence, rights may often issue demands for investment. Then when we answer that demand, we acquire standing to issue calls of investment on the rights bearer, now investee. Another way to put the point is that by doing our duty, we may put others in debt to us. And although it's common for people to, pro to protest this possibility, insisting, you don't owe me anything, I was just doing my duty. This, as we all know, is malarkey. When our duty is to invest in someone, we do have expectations of the investee, namely gratitude. And that's a teaser for my talk tomorrow, which is about gratitude. So many rights do not demand investment. For example, the classic negative rights, such as the right not to be killed unjustly, or the right to dispose of one's property as one sees fit. When we respect such rights, we do not thereby generate any kind of call on the rights bearer. It is only when respecting a right requires a positive investment that we, require, we acquire any kind of special standing relative to the rights bearer. So here's a little bit of a breakdown. There might be a range of reasons for investing in a person. You might invest in a person because they have a claim right on you that you invest in them. You would then have a perfect duty to invest in them. So you might, for example, have a, a duty to help a family member in need. Or you might invest in someone because you have an imperfect duty to invest in someone or other, and they happen to be there. Um, in this case, you have a duty without a correlative claim right, so you might think here of giving to charity, investing in a person by giving to charity. And you also might invest in someone not as a matter of obligation, but for some other reason. So, for example, investing in your children is largely not a matter of responding to rights or a feeling that you have duties. Each of these generates a call of investment which is a call upon the investee to recognize and value the investor's own vulnerability and insufficiency. It's a call to treat the relationship as one of at least potential interdependence rather than one-way dependence. I hope then that at this point I have achieved the primary aim that I stated at the beginning of the talk. I aim to persuade you that interpersonal investment is the source of claims and debts that are analogous to, though distinct from, rights and duties. I hope to have persuaded you that, when thinking about what people, what people owe to each other, we need to keep investment-based relationships squarely in focus and not attend exclusively to rights-based claims. Okay, now by way of conclusion, I want to come back to the androids. Okay. And alongside Mia and Ethan, I want to add this short clip from the British series Black Mirror. In this episode titled, Be Right Back, I'm going to spoil a little bit of the episode for you, I'm sorry, but not all of it, just a little bit. Okay. In this episode, Martha and Ash are a loving couple entering a new stage of their life and relationship. Martha is paralyzed by grief when Ash is killed in an accident. It happens right at the beginning of the episode. And a friend who also lost a beloved partner connects her with a service that creates a virtual Ash on the basis of his online history. Ash was a very heavy user of social media, so there's a lot of online history for him. Martha uncomfortably, and not entirely willingly, takes comfort in her online interactions with Ash too, as I'll call him. Then he tells her that can, he can be installed in a physical body. On a particularly tough night, she places the order. So now she's in a physical, as well as intellectual and emotional relationship with an android. Unlike Mia and Ethan, though, there's enough glitches in Ash 2's behavior. He doesn't like the Bee Gees. Everything he knows about sex, he learned from online porn. There's enough glitches in his behavior that the relationship feels false to Martha and to the viewer. So in desperation to free herself from what her grief has wrought, she takes Ash 2 on a hike to a windswept swept cliff.
This wouldn't have ever happened, but if it had, he would have worked it out. Sorry, hang on, that's a very difficult sentence to process. Jump. What? Over there. I never expressed suicidal thoughts or self-harm. Yeah, well, you aren't you, are you? That's another difficult one, to be honest with you. You're just a few ripples of you. There's no history to you. You're just a performance of stuff that he performed without thinking, and it's not enough. Come on. I aim to please. Yes, a jump. Just do it. Okay. If you're absolutely sure. See, Ash would have been scared. He wouldn't have just let off. He would have been crying. He would have been... So Martha is looking for proof that Ash 2 isn't human in the sense that I've been talking about. She's looking... Whoa, just... Oh, well, there's only one slide left. Boy, steal my thunder there. Okay. She's looking to prove to herself that her relationship is not truly reciprocating, that the feeling she has are not reflected back at her from within him, and that he has no true grip, claim, or call upon her. But he foils her, and she's unable to sever the relationship. She cannot take Strawson's objective attitude toward him. And this is even knowing that Ash 2 really is just very, very good software. Anyway, I take it this is a highly plausible interpretation of the episode, that Ash 2 really is just an algorithm processing the human Ash's online breadcrumbs. And yet, even so, he's enough like a person, enough like Ash, that Martha cannot detach from him. Martha is trapped by the human drive to enter and maintain relationships of interdependence and emotional reciprocity. Indeed, we often, I'd say more often than not, overstep what we know to be the appropriate bounds of these Strawsonian attitudes, we're crazy for anthropomorphization. This is why one of the hardest things about child rearing or even dog training is curbing those reactive impulses, not resenting or feeling betrayed by the small child who lies or the dog who bites. On reflection, we know that small children and dogs are not apt targets for such attitudes because they do not have the capacities that are morally necessary for accountability. Yet it can be psychologically strenuous keeping our emotional responses in the appropriate non-reactive territory. In addition to resentment, disappointment, and betrayal, I've spent much of this talk on more positively valenced reactive attitudes like trust and care and love. I would urge that small children and dogs, and Ash too, are not appropriate targets of these attitudes either. Now don't get me wrong, of course we love and care for small children and dogs. And we also sort of practice placing trust in children in order to help them develop into trustworthy people. Child development psychologists say we scaffold children into their capacities for genuinely reciprocal human relationships. And we invest enormously in our small children. However, the love and care that we have for small children and our investment in them should be relatively simple, precisely because it should not be tangled up with propensities to resentment, betrayal, disappointment, and other reactive attitudes. So it's natural to worry that we would be making this kind of mistake entering into such a relationship with an AI, even one like Mia or Ethan, who give every evidence of being more than software, of being sentient. However, the reverse possibility is equally worrisome. Mia and Ethan, and some of the real-world AI we are likely to see within our lifetimes, may very well be capable of at least partially reciprocal relationships. They may be capable of demanding their rights, resenting the violation of their rights. They may be capable of mutual exchanges of investment, resulting in interdependent, trusting relationships. At the very least, once we are past a certain point of technological sophistication, it will be very difficult to tell that they are not capable of these things, 
to identify a basis for denying that human AI relationships have reached this point, we will then have to worry about betraying our androids. Uh, so, we've got some time for questions. Uh, there is a mic in the middle of the room for anybody who would like to ask questions. If you want to come down and line up behind the mic, you can do that. Uh, I'll ask you to keep your questions relatively brief. And also, we're going to be taking questions from people who are watching uh, the webcast live. So, as those come in, I'm going to intersperse those with uh, questions from people in the room. Is that, is the mic on? Is it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. more descriptive than I would expect it to be. I would expect it to be more prescriptive. In other words, I would be looking as a young person or even as myself for certain philosophical uh, streams of answers. Instead, what I felt, and you may correct me, and uh, this is my question, um, is the investment uh, basically, um, could I express it like uh, a, a, a bank or individuals or companies serving as a bank and customer to one another? In other words, I put in, I expect out. Um, if, if that's the case, um, if that's the case, that doesn't work. Um, the history is full of that. Um, and I will finish that kind of question slash answer uh, slash uh, uh, the comment is don't we need a bit more don't we need a set of standards that is independent of the reaction uh, independent because we if we expect positive reaction to investment to positive we will be bitterly disappointed most of the time so Since the mic isn't working, I'll try to repeat some of the core ideas so that anyone who couldn't hear may, uh, have, may pick it up. Um, so there, there's a concern about sort of the nature of the talk being descriptive rather than prescriptive. Um, and, uh, and then there's a question about the nature of investment, um, whether it is whether, and this is a habit of the term investment, is it invites you to think of it as like people like banks, and whether that is a, a, a bad analogy for what I'm talking about. Um, or whether it's the right analogy and the problems that might arise from that. Um, so on the first uh, issue, um, so the level at which the talk, or which my project, because this is taken from a book-length project, um, the level at, at which it operates is, it's true, largely descriptive. It's look at human relationships and see what kinds of claims we take ourselves to have on each other. And the main point I was trying to press here is that it's very easy in public discourse and also in academic work in these areas to focus exclusively on rights and duties as the primary claims that people have on each other. But I would say if you step back and you look at the, the emotions that are involved in human relationships, um, what you will see is that there's a whole other system of claims, or as I was calling them, calls, 
debts that we think we have to each other that are not based in rights, but that are based in the fact that we are invested in each, in each other. All right? So that is a descriptive project. However, it has a prescriptive upshot, which is what I was trying to allude to at the beginning and at the end with the slide with the um, moral and political theory, public policy, and personal relationships. The prescriptive upshot is that when we're operating in these arenas, we're having discussions and debates within these arenas. If we leave out these other kinds of claims and debts and focus exclusively on rights and duties, then we're going to end up missing a whole lot of human nature and human relationships that need to be taken into account. So that's the prescriptive upshot. And so if you're, if you're working in any of these areas, and we're all at the very least working in the area of personal relationships, right? Um, let me give you a an even more concrete characterization of the prescriptive upshot, okay? You really, it would be a bad thing if we operated in our personal relationships. Just take the relationship between spouses. If that relationship operated as a relationship that was exclusively a matter of rights and duties, right? You know, if I was always talking about how I have rights against my partner, that's not the core of those kinds of relationships. So that's what I'm trying to steer us away from. Okay. Um, all right, and then on the, the question about investment. Thank you, I think it's a, a great question. Um, and I have had qualms about using the term investment. I used to talk about interpersonal hope and investing hope in people. I stripped it out of this talk because um, I just, I didn't want to have one more concept. There's so many concepts that I was linking together. I didn't want to have one more hope that I had to make sense of and had to convey to you. <clears throat> um, so a hazard of the term investment is that it starts people thinking about financial investments. But in some ways, I kind of want you to think the other way. I want you to think, what's the most basic form of investment? It's probably like the parent-child investment. It goes in both directions, the way the parent invests in their child, the way the child comes to be invested in the parent. Um, if that's the most basic kind of investment, then we might be making a mistake when we think about sort of material investment in this kind of put it in, take it out terms. Because that's not the nature of interpersonal investment. It's not put it in, take it out, put it in, get a return. It's put it in because that's what builds the relationship. Um, so that was my comments on the concept of investment. Thanks. Okay, we've got a question that has come from somewhere on the internet, and I'm going to read that uh, right now. How does disobedience play into our rights-based and or investment-based relationships with AIs? What difference does it make, if any, if these systems are programmed always to obey us? Might we ever have a moral obligation to program our androids to be able to choose to disobey or hurt us? Yeah. I can, give it, I can give it to you again. Yeah, no, I, I got it. I got it. It's just a hard question. Yeah, and I don't know, if, I don't know how to answer it. Um, but thank you, internet questioner. Um, uh, so, okay. I mean, in some ways, that is pushing on the question that I, I really wanted to bracket, which is the question of what does, it, what does an AI actually have to have the capacities for? to be a rights-bearing creature or a rights-bearing being or a rights uh, or a being that can enter into these relationships of investment. I was trying to stay agnostic on that, right? Um, but the question about disobedience, I take it, is really pushing on, does, it, does a being have to be free in some sense or other, right? Metaphysically free or just capable of doing otherwise than directed to be the kind of being that uh, has rights or that we can be invested in or that can be invested in us. Um, and I, you know, like I said, my suspicion is that self-governance does have something to do with it. Um, so I mean, it, I think it raises this, the sticky issue of could we ever look at an AI that we had made and ask ourselves and say to ourselves, um, all that's missing is this bit of freedom, this bit of self-direction. And then we've got a being with rights, or a being that we have to engage with in these ways. And then should we do it? I don't know. We will. I'm sure we will, because we can't stop ourselves. Um, so yeah, that's a, the best I can do. That okay. Yeah. 
Any other questions? I don't know that I understood everything, or probably not, not much at all. So if you look at, there were two issues about looking at relationships in this investment, um, with this investment concept as a backdrop um, that I feel a little uneasy about. One is to think that the, act, the, invest, the investor does this investing on the basis of something inherent in that relationship to the other person. Um, it's my sense that a lot of those investments come from the relationship that the investor has with himself or herself. That it's their self-understanding of who they ought to be, independent of what the expectations are outside. So they're carrying this, um, this entire universe, which is kind of imaginary, which is also reflected in the idea that we take on AIs, most of which we're pretty sure right now they are not sentient, um, and we're already doing this kind of stuff. The other thing was when you introduced this um, triangle of the, I forget the terms, but that reminded me of um, something that's kind of patho pathological, or it's an idea of pathological uh, interpersonal relationships in transpersonal uh, psychology, where this dynamic of people um, getting angry each at each other and having expectation from each other is identified as something that really undermines relationships. It's not something, you, you, pro, you proposed that this um, process of investment is one that brings us together, that brings the idea of interdependence, but in reality, um, that's not all, it's not the case. So the, the first was about sort of the context in which investment occurs, um, and uh, the, it was suggested that some, some things I said were suggestive of the idea that investment was a response to the other person, but that in fact a lot of times we invest in another person not because of something about them, When we think of investment, when I invest in another person and that gives me some kind of claim on them, we typically think that that, that investment must have been welcome at least, right, if not invited. Right? Um, I actually think that's not always the case. I think that sometimes an investment can even be unwelcome and yet generate a claim upon the other person. Um, so here's a little, little story I have that, to kind of pump that intuition. So imagine. Um, a single mother and her, her young daughter. And the young daughter aspires to be a great ballerina someday. And her mother cannot afford to send her to ballet school. Um, but she, the mother has a sister, the aunt. Um, and the aunt could afford to support the niece into ballet school. But the niece um, really despises the aunt. Maybe she's a bigot and the niece wants nothing to do with her. Right? So the aunt secretly invests in her ballet education. She doesn't know that the money is coming from the aunt and she becomes, she goes to her, she gets her education and she becomes a dancer. And then, um, you know, at some point it comes out that the money came from her aunt and she might be quite angry about this, right? Would she, should she feel that her aunt has any kind of claim upon her? Any, you know, can the aunt say something like, you know, don't you dare drop out of ballet school after everything I invested you over all these years? Well, I think it depends. One thing it depends upon is what the aunt's motive was. If the aunt, if the aunt supported the niece because she wanted one day to be able to say, you owe me, well, then it seems less likely that she has a claim on her. But if she invested in her, say, out of love for her sister, right? she knows her sister wishes she could send the girl to ballet school, but she can't, well, then you could see the daughter actually genuinely and legitimately feeling she has some kind of debt. Um, so, I mean, I think the things that can motivate us to invest in other people are huge, huge, huge range of things, okay? And it's really the devil's going to be in the details about when it actually generates the kind of 
reciprocal relationship that I'm talking about. Now, one thing you alluded to was that, um, in fact, we may, just because of who we are and the kinds of creatures we are, invest in entities that are not capable of reciprocity with us. Right? And that's the whole point about Ash 2 there. So I take it Ash 2 is not genuinely capable of reciprocity. Um, at least that's, I think, a plausible interpretation of the episode. Um, and yet Martha can't help but be engaged with him as if it's a genuinely reciprocal relationship. Um, so, uh, yeah, and I think that's just, just part of what it is to be human because that's the kind of being we are. We are driven to be in these relationships with other people and with people like entities. Um, okay, so, sorry, that was a long, but that was my long answer to the first part of your question. And then you were asking about the triangle, right? And I take it the idea that these angry attitudes can actually be destructive of relationships. Sure, they can be destructive of relationships, but also imagine a relationship without any of them, right? Where if I'm in a relationship with somebody who just wrongs me over and over and over again and I never resent it, I mean, that's at least as pathological and that's at least as damaged a relationship as one where I actually have resentment towards the person who wrongs me. So um, the reactive attitudes, um, these emotions that are uh, about holding each other accountable are absolutely essential parts of what it is to be in a genuinely interpersonal relationship with somebody. If you try to somehow bracket them all off, then you're not in a personal relationship, you're in an objective relationship. You can't be impinged upon by them. Your feelings can't be touched by them and, and, you, and your feelings don't touch them and that's, um, a relationship not between persons but between things, really. Any other questions? What, one more? I, I would like to uh, uh, say that the word investment itself is evoking really negative feelings in me because investment assumes a return. Uh, many philosophical streams would promote service, um, sacrificial love that is not dependent on any return, does not expect any return, is just inherent to uh, the character of the person who gives that or not. Probably the best word for that is from Christian, uh, from Christian background, uh, agape love. But, but the investment itself, uh, as, I, as I stated, uh, really does not resonate with me because it reduces it to um, uh, action or reaction and, and uh, investment return and leaves out the capability of a human being to give unconditionally. Okay, well, point, point taken. I, I, I think that the term investment actually has a longer history than, than of something that presumes a return in the way a financial investment does. However, the relationship I'm talking about here does presume some kind of return, right? Because what I'm talking about is when you invest in a person, you get a claim on them. You get a call on them. They owe you something. Now, I will grant you, there are other modes of, I'm not claiming investment is the whole of human relationships, but I'm claiming this is an important form of relationship. And I recognize that there are ways of relating to people that don't presume any kind of resulting debt. However, I think a whole lot of human relationships do presume some kind of resulting debt. That's precisely what gratitude is about, right? So, if you do something for another person and then they turn around and spit on you, they've done something they shouldn't have done. They owed you better than that. You deserved better than that, right? And that's, it's, a, it's a mark of ingratitude if they did that. Um, and I think that's one sign of how when you put things, when you put yourself into another person, there is a presumption that they are then in some, they some way owe you something. They are, you are, they are in debt to you in some way. Um, it may be, it's, what the reason, what I want to resist is the suggestion that it has to be some kind of equal and same return. 
that is, I do not think is the case, right? It's not that I put this amount into you, therefore you must put this amount into me. But I put this into you and therefore we're in a relationship, we're in a reciprocal relationship. Um, so thank you for your talk. Um, so I think it's really interesting and really well describes uh, personal re or relationships, interpersonal relationships, um, the sort of bottom level of the three tiers that you had at the beginning when you said um, the right space paradigm had problems talking or uh, problems associated with sort of the philosophical discussion, then there was the policy and then the personal vision. I just uh, would like to give you an opportunity to say more about how um, the investment paradigm can address some of the shortcomings of the rights paradigm, specifically with respect to policy. That's kind of what I'm most interested in here. Um, simply because I think a lot of policy is sort of future-oriented in a really abstract way that might that I'm just having a hard time coming to grips with, um, given what you've said, uh, the way that you've described the investment mm -hmm. um, paradigm. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks. Um, great. So the, the question was an invitation to say more about how the investment paradigm um, the upshot of it, the implications of it for specifically the realm of public policy since I identified that as one area that would end up being impoverished if you only think about rights and duties. And it's a great question. Um, uh, so, and I can answer it only in very general abstract sort of terms, but what I'm thinking is along these lines. Um, when you think about designing public policy um, and you're thinking about affecting massive numbers of people, um, it's very easy to think, well, we just need to make sure everyone's rights are respected. Um, and yeah, yeah, you do want to make sure everyone's rights are respected. Um, but if you also take into account the fact that people are in these relationships, these reciprocating relationships of investment um, and um, more broadly sort of interpersonal ties and dependencies, uh, then you may find that there, you, public policy needs to provide certain kinds of support. So it might lead you to think more about sort of pre-existing <laughs> communities in a way that you wouldn't think about, right? Because if you're thinking just about sort of rights and sort of universal claims that each person has in virtue of being this individual rights bearer, that doesn't focus you on pre-existing communities and ties and the ways that they need to be supported within a policy. Right? Whereas if you're thinking about those kinds of pre-existing ties, um, then you may be thinking about more um, positive forms of support for pre-existing communities, not only creating space, but allowing people to pull together. Right? So I'm thinking again of this metaphor, it's like rights pushing for independence, investments tying together. Um, I wouldn't think that it would be sensible to think that public policy can sort of make people invest in each other, <laughs> but it can provide uh, a friendly environment for that. It can make it easier for people to invest in each other, and it can, and it can um, support pre-existing investments. Well, if there are no other questions, there's a couple of things I want to mention to you. Uh, first of all, please remember to fill out your evaluation cards before you go. Uh, second of all, uh, I hope you'll all uh, join us in the reception, uh, in the lobby for a reception. And finally, uh, please join me again in thanking Professor Martin.
precisely. Uh, and then those got a hospital box from this, and, and they've been extremely helpful for things like this. Yeah, I will text you. Yeah.